peak inequality, the 0.01%, and the impoverishment of society, Part 5, written by David DeGraw. Part 5, The Aristocracy and the Death of Liberty. Quote, the first truth is, is that the liberty of a democracy is not safe if the people tolerate the growth of private power to a point where it becomes stronger than their democratic state itself. That, in its essence, is fascism. Ownership of government by an individual, by a group, or by any other controlling private power. Unquote. Franklin D. Roosevelt, 1942 from the moneyed aristocracy to the gilded age and the roaring twenties, extreme wealth inequality has always threatened freedom and democracy. Many of the most respected U.S. presidents have highlighted the fight against concentrated wealth as the first priority of a free society. Even in times of war, presidents have referred to bankers as being a bigger threat to the country than enemies on the battlefield. Visionaries and leaders such as Bunkminster, Fuller, and President Franklin D. Roosevelt saw the modern advancement of technology and increase in productivity and wealth creation occurring. They began to envision a near future where people could regain their freedom from the dreary compulsion of industrialism. Roosevelt proposed an economic bill of rights that would guard against any unhealthy levels of inequality and guarantee economic security for every citizen. He equated the concentration of wealth to fascism and gangster rule. Upon accepting his second nomination as president, before World War II started, Roosevelt declared a war for economic freedom against the 0.01%. He compared the wealthiest members of society to the British monarchy during revolutionary times. Quote, the average man once more confronts the problem that faced the Minuteman. The savings of the average family, the capital of the small businessman, the investments set aside for old age, other people's money. These were tools which the new economic royalty used to dig itself in. For too many of us, the political equality we once had won was meaningless in the face of economic inequality. A small group had concentrated into their own hands and almost complete control over other people's property other people's money, other people's labor, other people's lives. Against economic tyranny such as this, the collapse of 1929 showed up the despotism for what it was. The royalists of the economic order have conceded that political freedom was the business of the government, but they have maintained that economic slavery was nobody's business. These economic royalists complain that we seek to overthrow the institutions of America, what they really complain of is that we seek to take away their power. Our allegiance to American institutions requires the overthrow of this kind of power. In vain, they seek to hide behind the flag and the Constitution. In their blindness, they forget what the flag and the Constitution stand for. Now, as always, they stand for democracy, not tyranny, for freedom, not subjection, and against the dictatorship by mob rule and the overprivileged alike. America, we are waging a great and successful war, is not alone a war against want and destitution and economic demoralization. It is more than that. It is a war for the survival of democracy. I accept the commission you have tendered me. I join with you. I am enlisted for the duration of the war. Unquote. The war against the 0.01% was temporarily derailed when World War II began. However, even at the height of WW2, during Roosevelt's 1944 State of the Union address, he kept the focus on the 0.01% and said that they were, quote, the greatest problem, unquote, facing the nation. He called out, quote, a noisy minority, unquote, which, quote, maintains an uproar of demands for special favors for special groups. Unquote. He described them as, quote, pests who swarm through the lobbies of the Congress and the cocktail bars of Washington, representing these special groups as opposed to the basic interests of the nation as a whole. Unquote. Roosevelt saw World War II as an extension of the deeper battle against economic slavery, 
wealth inequality, and the 0.01% who prevailed in the 1920s and led the nation into the Great Depression. Here's another excerpt from his 1944 State of the Union Address. Quote, we are united in determination that this war shall not be followed by another interim, which leads to new disaster, that we shall not repeat the excesses of the wild twenties. If history were to repeat itself, and we will return to the so-called normalcy of the 1920s, then it is certain that even though we shall have conquered our enemies on the battlefields abroad, we shall have yielded to the spirit of fascism here at home." Unquote. When looking at the unprecedented level of wealth inequality in today's society, it is obvious that the spirit of fascism has prevailed. Instead of increased productivity and wealth being a very good thing for overall society, the short-sighted greed of the 0.01% has systematically taken the increase in wealth for themselves, robbing everyone else of a life of liberty, economic security, and freedom. The gangster rule that Roosevelt warned against is now the norm. The 0.01% acts with impunity, totally above the law, engaging in trillions of dollars in fraudulent activity without being held accountable. In fact, they are rewarded with all-time record-breaking bonuses and ever-increasing wealth. The 0.01% economic royalists hand down their dictates through centrally planned economic policy and government legislation designed to keep the population economically insecure subservient, and enslaved to debt. Through their ownership of mainstream media companies, they keep the masses in ignorance, wholly unaware of the paradigm shift in technology and wealth creation that should have provided economic security and made life much more enjoyable for everyone well over a generation ago. We now live in a neo-feudal society. The evidence is undeniable. The indentured servant is now the indebted wage slave. A recent scientific study revealed that the United States government is subservient to the whim of the 0.01%. Political office is now merely a stepping stone and initiation process that politicians go through to be accepted into the aristocracy. The 0.01% aristocracy is exactly what the first American Revolution was against. It was Thomas Jefferson's understanding of the aristocracy's ability to consolidate wealth and subvert government that led him to believe that every generation required its own revolution. Here are two prophetic quotes from Jefferson. Quote, Our country is now taking so steady a course as to show by what road it will pass to destruction, to wit, by consolidation of power first, and then corruption, its necessary consequence. Unquote. Quote, I hope we shall take warning from the example and crushing in its birth, the aristocracy of our moneyed corporations, which dare already to challenge our government to a trial of strength and bid defiance to the laws of our country. Unquote. In discussing the spirit of the people and the need to nourish and perpetuate that spirit, Jefferson also said, quote, I am not among those who fear the people. They, and not the rich, are our dependents for continued freedom. And to preserve their independence, we must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. We must make our election between economy and liberty, or profusion and servitude. Unquote. Peer past propaganda, and you will see that the aristocratic spirit of fascism has conquered the spirit of the people. As wealth and power have been consolidated in an unprecedented fashion, the overwhelming majority toils in servitude and perpetual debt. Economic tyranny is the new normal. The Coming Revolution Quote, All countries are basically social arrangements, accommodations to changing circumstances, no matter how permanent and even sacred they may seem. In fact, they are all artificial and temporary. Unquote. Strobe Talbot we present this report as a declaration of the causes which impel our separation from a corrupt and oppressive government. After analyzing current policies and economic conditions, it is now evident that the systematic exploitation of a majority of the population will continue without redress. The need for significant systemic change is now a mathematical fact. 
corruption, greed, and economic inequality have reached a peak tipping point. As more people grow aware of the deliberate systemic nature of their unnecessary suffering, exploitation, and oppression, there will soon be a critical mass who will insist upon nothing less than absolute revolution. The delusional political class and mainstream media uphold the status quo as if it is insurmountable. In reality, it is highly unstable, unsustainable, and collapsing at an increasing rate. Quote, the civilization may still seem brilliant because it possesses an outward front, the work of a long past, but it is in reality an edifice crumbling to ruin, destined to fall in at the first storm. Unquote. Gustave Le Bon, The Crowd Revolution is inevitable.